Sorry, these lights are kind of bright and I have an aversion to light. Uh, but uh, thank you for coming to the talk. Again, uh, my name is uh, Michael Aguilar. Uh, I'm a. <laughs> oh, perfect. Thank you so much. Oh, God, now I can see. <laughs> All right. Uh, everybody, thank you for coming. Again, uh, my name is Michael Aguilar. Uh, basically, I'm going to give a talk about uh, dysfunctional unity, and I'll kind of touch on what that is and kind of um, what I'm talking about. So me, myself, I am a principal consultant for SecureWorks Adversary Group. Um, my specialties range in a lot of different practices for offensive security. Again, things like physical security, uh, breaking into buildings, social engineering, uh, basically lying my rear end off to get in that building, uh, adversary simulations, uh, binary exploitations, uh, uh, web exploitations, and uh, also making uh, medical devices play Doom. Uh, that's kind of my fun thing to do for uh, medical devices, I guess, uh, when you kind of get uh, area of privilege. Uh, free time activities, uh, I do like to uh, read a lot. Uh, basically, if my head is not in a book, um, it's in another book. Um, I like to practice my offensive coding skills. Again, you know, things like AV bypasses, AMSI bypasses, things that you'll actually be using in the field that I use pretty much all the time. Uh, I like to, uh, again, read constantly, uh, but again, free time to blow off stress, a lot of cycling, uh, running, swimming, just basically kind of gets a heart beating because I like to break into buildings, so I figure that the better I take care of myself, the more I can keep doing this as a profession. Uh, I also like to get tattoos, it puts me to sleep, and I am a fan of very fast, loud uh, music. So, um, going over, uh, let me take my glasses off actually a first for me. Um, what is this function that I'm talking about and how it applies to what I'm speaking about with regards to the medical device topography and vendors and I should say medical device manufacturers and the FDA and the governing people of that. Uh, I'm also going to talk about a few wars that are basically been won through attrition uh, when trying to release CBEs. Uh, and also some of the lurking dangers of interconnected medical devices, some of the things that we kind of need to be looking at in the future, and um, my theories on a brighter future of how we can actually start doing more things to actually be secure with regards to deploying these items in secured infrastructure. <coughs> so, when you think about dysfunction, I put this here because obviously, if you're thinking about dysfunction, this is one of the most dysfunctional families that we've seen in America. I'm not gonna lie, the family that I'm talking about seems to be one of the most dysfunctional families in America. And this is again between the tester, uh, the MDM, and the, uh, the federal government in the way that they uh, manage these things. So according to the Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary, um, again, what is dysfunction? Uh, it can be described as an abnormal or unhealthy uh, interpersonal behavior and uh, interaction, again, with a group. So again, uh, the groups that I'm talking about are security researchers, uh, the manufacturers that make these devices, and the rule makers who actually enforce the rules that are supposed to be applied to these devices as they're uh, ingested into our internal infrastructure. Now, <laughs> Basically, these groups are all separated entities um, that should normally uh, be able to work cordially together in a standard format. Um, occasionally, though, the uh, conversations uh, between researcher and, uh, like, say, the person you're trying to work with to release a vulnerability, the manufacturer, um, it turns a little bit different. Again, they have a different idea, an ideology of how things should work in their topography versus the actual researcher and the you know nuts and bolts person who actually does the exploitation on these devices. Again, um, you know, us as researchers, when we do these things, we're using techniques and skills that we've you know done again and again with proven track records, you know, to show the range of the exploit that we're actually deploying on this. Um, but the issue that I'm running into is that the guidelines that are being set forth by federal governments, the FDA, are namely just recommendations. They're not really hard rules. The hard rule is that if you have a device with vulnerabilities, they won't sell it in the domestic market. But 
in order to get there, they give you guidelines. You should do this. Not you need to do this, a rule like, you know, cut you out. It's you should. And a lot of people use this to their advantage because, again, they're not making the smart choices that they need to make in these devices to deploy them into a critical infrastructure. Now, the other issue is uh, what happens when there is an impasse between a researcher and the MDM that you're trying to release the CBE with? Um, who plays that neutral third party? A lot of times, the MDMs themselves will actually be their own CNAs. Um, which makes it so that they actually release their own CBEs. Now, the problem is that when you're arguing something between somebody who actually does it and like the person who's making it, they can just keep stalling and stalling and stalling and then eventually you'll just give up because you don't want to have to wait like six months, a year, two years, three years to put out a CBE. And honestly, to tell you the truth, I don't even care about the CVE. I'm just trying to get the stuff fixed in the product because obviously I saw it, I experienced it, I exploited it. And if I can do it, then somebody else can. And it's you know not me who I'm worried about, it's other people who are going to be attacking our infrastructure that is my main concern. Now, again, my feeling is that, again, reporting to telemetry that I have turned in, again, regarding uh, findings and stuff that is being ingested by the FDA is not really fully understood to the full of its capacity. A lot of times you're turning in a report with some somewhat critical and questionable flaws, but the project will still be accepted and acknowledged by the FDA and then later sold in the domestic market. What happens? and to be able to get to that point, I have no idea because, again, I don't work for a manufacturer. I'm just the consultant that does the test. But the main issue that I have is, again, these major vulnerabilities and these classes of vulnerabilities that can potentially kill somebody or the entire hospital are getting passed through. And I have no idea how this is getting from A, me, B, report, to C, you're accepted to your 510K. This does not make any sense to me. Also, again, when they read about a threat, what they're looking at is basically it's just a single device, you know, in a box. They're not looking how this item is interconnected or using the connections that they have actually installed on this. You'll notice a lot of medical devices are almost legacy devices with an ESP32 or some other device to allow a networking stack to be able to transmit this data back and forth. I mean, we're talking about a single device, right? It's just one device. What's going to happen? And that's the main thing, is that when the companies look at these exploits, these things that I turn in, it's like, oh, it just happened on a device. You know, what's going to happen? Um, again, one is that uh, these systems, again, are interconnected, meaning that they are connected to a hospital. Now, a lot of times, again, to get access to that, that means that basically you just you know, plug something in. There's just like network ports everywhere in hospitals and a lot of times they're just not dead. So again, they say that it may um, only affect one device, but again, this one device is connected to a multiple item or multiple plethora of network nodes uh, through Active Directory and other means. And um, many times, again, also the manufacturers say that you're not supposed to plug in the device. Uh, the device has an ethernet port, but it does not need to be plugged in. But again, if the Ethernet port does not need to be plugged in, then why does it exist in the device topography? Also, again, you have to understand where these items are plugged into. They're plugged into probably a hospital network. Now, a hospital network contains what? Active Directory. So that's kind of the problem, is that now you have a device with a vulnerability that is connected to an Active Directory network that is able to either utilize NTLM credentials that you may be able to take an exploit and steal, then point upwards, do things like ADCS flaws and other kinds of Kerber roasting stuff to get privilege escalation, basically to take over the entire domain from that one device. Um, again, these kinds of devices are also prime candidates to jump off from in the network. Even if it's not AD joined, this still gives you the same kind of access to be able to start doing other attacks, to be able to get those kind of credentials from within the network, password sprays and other kinds of things, looking for open shares, checking for simple passwords, checking for anything that basically will give you stuff. I've gotten a lot of actual uh, credentials by just utilizing network sniffing and pcreds and other kind, or credmaster, or I'm sorry, cred slayer to basically analyze pcap files and pull up the NTLM credentials from pcap files just from listening passively. 
from the guise of a medical device. The second thing is that I don't get, again, is when I turn in a report with a critical flaw, but it's still accepted by the FDA. And these are things that basically will either kill a patient, take over the entire hospital, or blow up the hospital. In one instance, basically, I turned a something that was supposed to clean items into a makeshift bomb because of the access for field service engineering, uh, a heat bay that you now can modify the control temperatures for, and the usage of pure oxygen and pure alcohol in the thing to do the sanitation. Now, this leads to kind of how I expect things to kind of go in the future, which is I hope that the FDA and CISA is looking towards offering more and more like um, support by hiring people that actually understand kind of what's going on. Um, that's kind of like nine tenths of the problem is that the people who are reading this don't understand that NTLM theft is bad or that you can actually get domain admin from a lower privileged user. It's just like they look at it and they're like, okay, there's a flaw and you quote unquote remediated it or you have a justification to say that you should be passing credentials in clear text or whatever the hell happens that gets into these passes. What happens? I don't know because again, I'm disconnected from this process. But if anybody has insight into how that happens, please, I'll be right there. Just let me know what's going on. Now, a lot of times also, medical device manufacturers will say, this is in a protected area. So again, as I mentioned, I also lead the physical security assessments for my firm. So in 2022, like basically my entire summer was breaking into protected areas. So the fact that it's in a protected quote unquote area doesn't really mean anything. Have you, everybody's been to a hospital, right? They have the double doors, you walk in, it's, that's, you know, it's, he senses you, the IR reader, opens the doors. Uh, do you think you'd really be able to get in just wearing some scrubs, a badge you cloned, and like looking like a general doctor? It's pretty easy. All you have to do is like keep your head down, just nod to people, act like you work there, and then they will pretty much believe that you do that if you fit in with a certain profile. So again, utilizing all of that theory, having these devices in these quote unquote protected areas really doesn't mean much if you can actually get access to these protected areas. Now, again, the issue is that obviously you need to get into these, but to think that somebody wouldn't do this if they really needed to affect the topography of a certain area is a fool's game. And then uh, one time I was challenged by an MDM um, to basically get into the device with under two minutes uh, to try to get the exploit going because they said that, oh, obviously, you know, we have a case, you know, everything's fine. Uh, cases don't matter. Again, if you have a case, that's fine. But basically, you need an alarm on it to sound if you want to make that protected. And that's as per the FDA. So my record for actually opening and exploiting a device in a case was less than two minutes. So basically, you open the case, I had a bunch of screws flying everywhere, did the exploit, got the shell, closed the backup, and then we're all good in under two minutes. So I only needed two minutes on door to be able to get that exploit out the door and then get code execution. And then now I'm system on the thing that's going to be cutting people up. So again, another layer of the dysfunctional reality of what we have going on with medical and MDM and researchers is that again, Placing these connected devices onto the hospital network also increases some level of risk. Um, if it's not meant to be connected onto the network, then again, I still don't know why they put networking on these. Most of the time what I hear is that the developers for the boards are just utilizing what's there. And sometimes that has Wi-Fi. They just don't know how to disable it or they will just leave the chip on there. And that's the kind of aspect that I hope to see in the future change in that, again, if it's not needed and if it's not supposed to be plugged in, then don't keep the stuff in there. I mean, hell, just put some freaking glue in the port and then make sure that it won't go in. It's really pretty simple. A soldering iron can do this. But again, this is the part I don't get where they put in big words in their uh, fact, don't plug this in on the network, but here's a network jack. 
Also, hospitals themselves are dealing with a high, with a ton of issues right now. Um, again, you've always seen a lot of ransomware going off in hospitals, and why do you think that is? And I've been on a lot of adversarial simulations as well. And again, the security of these places is very down level. Now, my reason or my theory for this is because, again, the legacy devices, the medical devices that exist in this topography, don't have the strongest security settings. Other times, they can accept the strongest security settings. It's an impossibility. Some of these devices can't even have a password over eight characters because it will break something. So that's why the level of security sometimes drops within these infrastructures because of their inclusion of these kinds of devices and the allowance for them to be able to run. So then we have scenarios where obviously people, you know, who know what they're doing within a network and can actually attack a system will see all these gaps in security and take advantage of that and then launch their ransomware payloads against the topography of the hospital. Hospitals used to have a pass from threat actors against doing actions like this, but that pass has been revoked as we've been seeing in the recent months with many hospitals again being hit by ransomware operators and ransomware firms. Now, there is a key point. Again, continuous uh, adversarial assessments uh, is kind of key. Um, and one thing I always see when I'm on a hospital network, which is odd, is an OU that says, like, defender or semantic disabled. And then there's a bunch of systems in there. And they're normally critical. There's, I mean, that's data that you basically, as you're ingesting as a threat actor, you can just take actionable, look it up. If you're in an internal network for a hospital, look up an OU called disabled. I guarantee you, you'll probably find one with devices that aren't running any kind of software, and that's for a specific reason. Critical, high, high target assets, so go ahead and take a look if you do those kind of assessments. But also, again, the gears of these organizations are very slow to move. Um, if anybody's ever worked in the medical field trying to get any kind of change like you know actually accepted is a constant uphill battle <laughs> so again there is a way out of this and that's again getting good uh, goal-based offensive testers actually doing the tests for these um, it's funny to me because a lot of times when I come onto a client site, I will just talk to the client, you know, how did your last pen test go? There's things you liked about it, you know, things you didn't. A lot of times they'll just show me the report and I'm like, okay, this is some stuff. But there's some similarities that I'm seeing between the medical testers that I experience is that they're not too thorough. Uh, key point, one client uh, showed me a report, prior test, uh, they got the reverse shell, yay. That was it. Basically, that was the pun. They got a reverse shell. That was the same one that I had the POC that basically blew up the hospital. So there was no post-exploitation. There was nothing done to look for configuration files. There was nothing that was actually done as far as cracking passwords. There was nothing done to escalate privileges. They just got a shell, called it a day, probably scanned it with Nessus, and that's it. So there's a little bit of a difference that good offensive uh, adversarial testing can give you versus just the general scan and click and that's this kind of chill thing. Um, I know it's hard as a person who may be purchasing these things. Again, you may be thinking that the sticker shock of a test who may be $10,000 more than your other tester just because they're local um, is viable for your operation because you may get a pass. But again, is that going to be cheaper in the long run? Think about this. You get a pass for, you know, your device as you're putting out in like the X widget. And the tester did, you know, Nessus and map, everything looks good, you know, it runs, you know, it's you can put it on the market, you can turn in your artifact that says you had a pen test. But is that really gonna be cheaper in the long run if that device gets found to have a critical flaw in the field where possibly it could probably kill somebody? And then somebody tries to publish that, and then you have to take it off it with the recall? and then you have to put it back on and submit another 510K. The cost, again, comes up a lot more when you have to do that versus if you just do it right the first time and go with somebody who say, you know, you know has a you know, val valid reputation for testing these things, has a body of work or something, you know. So when you're doing these kinds of choices for your testers, just kind of research, you know, what they have as far as skill sets and just make sure that everything is a thorough check versus just a reverse shell and we're done. 
also, again, when you are getting these things, uh, you know, obviously we want to help you. So what I like to look at is myself as a budgetary tool. Um, the harder I hit the system, that's more money that you get in your pocket for budget. So basically, again, um, you know, I like to look at myself as a kind of a force multiplier. Now, again, wars run through attrition. Uh, I've had a lot of open discussions with some medical device vendors, but um, my hopes are that, again, we can kind of work together in some kind of uniform fashion. Uh, I'm kind of tired of tr people trying to sue me for no fucking reason. So uh, the sooner that they start to wake up and realize that I'm doing this shit for free, at like here, they should like, you know, accept these things and actually try to work with us versus trying to sue us with litigation because like I don't care about your stupid binaries. Again, case in point, last time I tried to release a CBE, uh, there was group A um, who, well, I, there was the first group who was very receptive, everything worked fine. There was group B, um, they didn't get anything, we talked. We came back, we talked more. They had no understanding what the physical vulnerabilities were going on. They just basically said like, oh, well, you know, I have a, one guy was screaming, I have a screwdriver, I can break into fucking anything. I'm like, I don't even know what the hell's going on with you, sir. You must be having a bad day. Um, and then you get an email saying, I need you to affirm in writing uh, and certify that X, Y, and Z. That comes from the law department, that's not from the person that wrote it. So. Again, I know what's coming next in that order. Uh, so again, I think that hopefully under some time we can actually work together in a cohesive manner and kind of all get together and maybe have beers afterwards. Also, wars run through attrition. And this is my view of companies that write their own C uh, CVEs. Um, again, it's kind of hard because if you write the CVE and I'm the researcher, who do you think is going to be the neutral ground? Like, there's no neutral ground. I write the CVE. This is what's going to happen. Here's how the here's the here's the severity. You know, nobody's understanding what's actually going on. Um, and again, <laughs> um, does this feel like neutral ground? If you make the CVE, and you have to argue with the same people that are the owners of this project, and you basically cannot go off of anything. So you know, this is this is not neutral in my opinion. Um, Again, healthcare is very <laughs> expensive. Uh, so again, we need to make better decisions when we're connecting these devices on the interconnected space. Uh, so again, you know, the better we do with making the smart items uh, more secure, uh, the better we'll be in the long run. We'll have less ransomware and less issues kind of plaguing us with regards to uh, severe vulnerabilities in medical devices. Um, also, one thing of note with genetics, uh, don't go away like, you know, just handing out your genetic data to all these random places because it's kind of hard to change your uh, genetic sequence. Uh, you can change your driver's license pretty easy. You need like a CRISPR and a lot of time and effort to change your DNA. Um, again, we can do better, I feel, as a group. You know, we can all kind of hopefully come come to some kind of agreement that says like, hey, guns down, like, let's just actually start working together. Uh, but that's going to be in the future when, again, we actually start uh, realizing that these items are critical assets. When you release a CVE for a medical device, guess who also notes the CVE? CISA, because it's critical infrastructure. So the more we start looking at them as critical, the more that these manufacturers hopefully will start actually making the smart decisions. Now, mind you, I know that they know that they're critical because they're class two and class three medical devices, but necessarily criticality, I think, differs in our opinion of things. Um, let's see, okay, cool. I got one example. Okay, reason. Okay, anybody familiar with DICOM? All right, cool. So has anybody heard of Peticom? Yeah, you have. Nobody else. Okay, cool. So basically, uh, it was a research project released five years ago. Somebody made uh, the ability to ingest or execute DICOM images from the command line by stuffing a uh, PE header in the 128 byte preamble. So basically, now you have 128 bytes of free space to throw uh, malware. So here is um, something I'm going to show you. All right, cool, cool. All right, so this is a DICOM file. This is an image, okay? You open it with Radiant, you'll see an image, okay? This is that same DICOM file. This is that same DICOM file running. Uh, let's see, and, well, a second ago, oh, that's why, no network, huh, funny. 
Damn it. Uh, sorry. So basically, the whole long story is, you can actually execute these images from the command line, and you'll get a reverse shell. I'm not going to tell you how, because I have tooling to do this, and the issue is that the researcher who originally released this did not release a POC. Now, the other issue is that antivirus engines have a hard time scanning these types of files. Reason being is, again, it looks like an image. It opens like an image. In all purposes, it is an image. If you open it up with a DICOM viewer, it will open up and show you the actual image. So that's the issue, is that you lose no file integrity, the image is still intact, and now you've chucked 128 bytes of malware and you'll get a reverse shell. If you would like to talk more about that kind of thing, uh, I'll be in the biohacking village uh, doing this to multiple people who ingest DICOM files. So it's going to be an interesting time, um, but necessarily, again, you can take theoretical research and turn it into actionable data. So now I have a project that, again, shoves malware into DICOM images, and due to the way that you have to keep these images, they'll now be on disk for about five to ten years because of rules with deletion. Also, there's a worm that will overwrite all of the headers for all the other files that are DICOM in the same directory and basically make them do the same thing. So enjoy that. <laughs> and other than that, um, <laughs> basically, in the end, we can all work together and hopefully we come to some kind of cohesive conclusion uh, where we can actually uh, do things like kind of like a family versus like apart from each other. And I'll make sure to get these slides online. Sorry, kind of pressed for time and everything. I was going kind of slow initially. Normally I'm pretty spitfire, but tried to uh, talk a little slower. Um, but that's the end. Any questions really quick before we get out? All right, good to go.